Welcome to the NTEB Radio Bible Study with your host and Bible teacher, Jeffrey Greider. Rightly divided, dispensationally correct, and standing on the authority of the King James Holy Bible. This program is brought to you by NowTheEndBegins.com. And good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Sunday night edition of Rightly Dividing. My name is Jeff Greider. I am the editor-in-chief of NowTheEndBegins.com, and tonight... For the next two hours, I have the honor and the privilege of being your radio host and Bible teacher. Tonight's topic, it's a big topic. It's a topic that many of you have been asking for. Um, Antichrist, the four beasts, Nebuchadnezzar, and the coming ten-nation confederacy from the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. On this episode of Rightly Dividing, we travel back in time. To the original kingdom of Babylon, we meet Nebuchadnezzar, who is an amazing type of Antichrist, who shows us the seven-year time of Jacob's trouble, the coming kingdoms, and four really scary beasts. Then we flash forward to the book of Revelation, and we and the types become real, and the prophecies begin to fulfill themselves. It's a wild, wild ride. What a thing, man, what a thing. Daniel has been dead a long time, but he, through his word, he yet speaketh. And what and we would do well to heed his words, take them with us on a rocket ride through Revelation, and apply them to the crazy, crazy, crazy times that we now find ourselves in, the time of the end. And that's exactly where we are. You know, uh, Jacob says to his sons, in Genesis 49, verse 1, all the way back in the book of Genesis. Genesis 49, verse 1, And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together, that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. And here we are in the year 2020, thousands and thousands of years after Jacob made that prophecy to his 12 children, the 12 tribes of Israel. And he said, let me tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. And here we are. Bill Gates and the Mark of the Beast system and Emmanuel Macron, who wants to rule Europe like a uh, Roman god. Man, <laughs> These are crazy, crazy, crazy days. We have lots of questions already. Sally says, can the vaccine be the mark of the beast? We're going to answer that question tonight, Sally. And uh, we're going to answer a whole lot of other questions for you as well. Uh, so uh, very glad that you're tuning in. If you're just new to this program, we'd like to welcome you. We have had hundreds and hundreds of new listeners lately, and we from all over the world, from uh, East Africa and Sri Lanka and Egypt and Russia, and uh, just great, great in India, just fantastic places where this program is now reaching people, and, and that is just such an answer to prayer. It's such a blessing, and I have a big announcement for you guys tonight. So um, uh, God is expanding the ministry of Now the End Begins, and uh, we are going even farther out. We're even farther out now, and in just a little while, I'm going to give a, a really exciting announcement of, of how God is working with this ministry and how he's expanding us. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask for his blessing, Heavenly Father. We thank you for your goodness, and we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for everything you give us, Lord. You woke us up today, and there's food on the table, there's clothes on our backs, and there's a roof over our head, and uh, we're grateful, God. We are very, very grateful, Father God. And uh, Lord, I thank you for raising up now the end begins and all these millions of people that you're bringing in and, and they have questions. And fortunately, your word already has the answer, Father God. And uh, thank you, Lord, for raising up this ministry at this place and this time. And uh, Lord, I also pray for we, we as a church family, we pray if there's anyone listening tonight who is lost, who is not saved, that something will be said in this program uh, that will lead them to want to search for you, Lord, to want to um, 
The Philippian jailer says to Paul and Silas, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. So uh, we pray, Father God, if there's any lost people listening tonight, people perhaps who have just tuned in because of all the talk about the Mark of the Beast and Emmanuel Macron and the Ten Nation Confederacy and all that exciting stuff, but none of that means anything, Lord, if we're lost. None of that means anything if we learn about all these things and wind up dying and going to hell anyway. So, Father God, we just pray that even in this late hour that you would save, Lord, that you would work and you would move and you would save. And we commit this time to you. We ask you to keep the enemy out, keep the devil out, Lord. Uh, Set a hedge of protection about this program and this ministry and these people who are coming in so they can learn, Lord, and uh, that the word can be preached in spirit and in truth and that people, Lord, they have come here to learn. And if there's anybody here who hasn't come to learn, if they've just caused to cause, if they've just come to cause trouble, we ask, Lord, that you remove them and keep them out. So, Father God, uh, we just commit this time to you and we ask you to bless it. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Romans 10.9 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So I'm glad that you're here tonight, and uh, we have so much news. It is... Uh, every day it's happening. It is We are literally, literally living within the pages of the Bible. And um, as I mean, every single show that we've been doing for weeks now, I have had something new and something new every single time. I have more new stuff tonight, but we're going to talk about that 10 nation confederacy. TJ especially asked for this last week and a a number of other people have asked for it as well. And there is so much that goes with the 10 nation confederacy and the four beasts of Daniel seven and uh, the image that Daniel sees with the head of gold and the silver and the brass and the iron and all those things. So we're going to touch on a little bit of everything tonight, and um, it's going to be a good general primer uh, for all these things. I mean, if we could do a 10-hour show on just the Ten Nation Confederacy, we could do a 10-hour show on just Daniel's image. So we only have two hours tonight. But we're going to touch on all these topics, and um, we're going to see what the Lord will do with it. In the chat room right now, we're coming up on 300 um, people chatting in the chat room, and lots and lots and lots of new people. Uh, we welcome you. We say hi to KT and and um, uh, a whole bunch of other people who are coming in. The chat room is going through so fast, I can hardly keep up with it, but uh, if you're new... We are very glad that you're here, and um, as we always do, the first half an hour, we play some music, Uh, we get our hearts and minds ready to receive the word, and uh, we've all had, even in in lockdown, we've all had busy days today, so uh, we always like to play some music and read some scripture and uh, really begin to make the transition into a rock-solid Bible study at the bottom of the hour. So um, if you're new, you're very welcome, and we're very glad that you're here. remind you of that, to rob you of your joy now that you're saved. I remember one such day, I was going by a place, way down back yonder, down memory lane, the old devil said, I remember when you were saved. I remember what you remember what you did right there. You know who you you know who you was hanging with there? And I had to admit, I said, yeah, I remember that devil. And that day I didn't let him do all the talking though. Hey, I said, I remember all of that. But there's one thing, only one thing I can say to you about it. Hey, is it's under the yes, blood. Hey, Hope this song will be a blessing. Hey, Of long ago, 
Oh, Satan came right by my side, making me feel low. He brought up thoughts of hurt and pain when I had gone astray. He wanted to discourage me as I walked along my way. He said, you're undeserving, cause I know where you've been. I have a record of your life when you were bound by sin. I know your darkest secrets that you would never tell. What makes you think you don't deserve a place with me in hell? Well, I heard the old accuser, and this was my reply. You're right for all the things I've done. I sure deserve to die. My righteousness is filthy rags. My goodness is unclean. There's only one thing I can say to what you said to me. It's time to Oh, praise His dear name. I'm not what I used to be. My life's been changed. Now shackled by sin and shame. It's already gone. I'm happy reminding Him. It's under the blood. Oh, yes, it is. I'm glad it is. I like this. Victory was given me when I was born again. He was my stained and sinful past and put new life with him. No longer do I bear the mark that sin had to rub my way. With happiness and peace of mind, praise God that can sing. It's time to go. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1, starting in verse 5, Ephesians 1, starting in verse 5, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom... We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he has purposed in himself. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ did for you and I the day we got saved. He cleansed and he saved and he redeemed all by the power of his shed blood. Once I wandered in sin's black night. There was no way to 
blood of Jesus that brings victory to me and that's where we get the victory that's where salvation comes from it comes from the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross at Calvary 2000 years ago Uh, I told you I had big news for you guys tonight and I want to share that with you right now Uh, really really exciting news Um, I have a Christian brother that um, through Facebook, and he lives out in Malaysia, and he, the Lord, has greatly blessed him with um, with a fantastic ministry on Facebook. It's called Bible Study and Prayer Group, and I'm putting a link into the chat room. I put a graphic into the chat room um, on Facebook. There is a group called Bible Study and Prayer. And it's a very, very large group. And um, the man who who owns that group, his name is Michael, and he lives, he's from America, but he lives in Malaysia with his wife, and he is just absolutely on fire for the Lord. And um, uh, the Lord put Michael and I together about three or four years ago, and we have been working together on a lot of things for quite some time. And um, uh, we have had a whole series of talks recently, and um, we have decided to merge the Now the End Begins Network with the Bible Study and Prayer Group, and that combined group results in over two million people that, as of this weekend, are now part of of the Now the End Begins radio network. So when I say that God has greatly expanded our borders, 
I am not kidding. Uh, so, so the combined um, membership of Now the End Begins and Bible Study and Prayer Group, we are well over 2 million people who are now part of this combined effort. And um, uh, God, I mean, we talked about this for a long time. We prayed about it. And this is absolutely what God wants to do. So I invite all of you, I invite all of you when you have time to go on Facebook and it's a group called Bible Study and Prayer, not the page, it's the group. And I invite everyone to go and join that group because we are merging um, our... Now, we still have all of our Now the End Begins groups and pages, um, and the Bible Study and Prayer group still maintains its own identity. But from a practical perspective, we have joined forces, and now... Both sides are sharing with each other, and it is just, I have been like walking on a cloud all weekend long, seeing what the Lord is doing um, with that, and that's very exciting for me. Michael is very excited. Um, he's a great Christian brother. Maybe at some point I'll have him on the program. We'll interview him so you guys can get to meet him, um, but... but uh, now the End Begins Global Network now has over 2 million people attached to it. So that is an answer to the Lord's um, leading. Uh, so please pray for Michael, pray for me as we begin to navigate these waters and we begin to take the gospel farther than we've ever taken it ever before. Uh, now, I see a lot of comments in the chat room about Facebook. And uh, if if you feel convicted to not be on Facebook, that's totally fine. I get it. I understand it. The Bible says that Satan is the prince of the power of the air. But this radio program is being broadcast over Satan's internet. It's being broadcast over the power of Satan's air. And um, if he can plunder God's kingdom we can certainly plunder his kingdom. And that's exactly what we're going to do. So if you're not on Facebook, that's totally fine. But if you are on Facebook, we invite everybody to come and join what's happening over at the Bible study and prayer group. And, um, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of big things in the pipeline, and I'm going to share those things with you. Uh, as as they get closer to happening, but the Lord is making it possible for me to start traveling, and my first stop is going to be Israel this summer. Um, the Lord has made it possible for me to go to Israel for two weeks this summer, and we are going to establish a Now the End Begins headquarters in Jerusalem. So uh, that also is very, very exciting. We are going to be establishing an, a Now the End Begins headquarters in Jerusalem, and I'm going to be going over there on a fact-finding mission for two weeks this summer. And um, if the Lord tarries, if we have time, I would love to take a group of people over to Israel, but honestly, I really don't know how much we're going to have time for. Um, but God has filled up my plate, my cup, to overflowing, and uh, I am so excited to be working with Michael from um, the Bible Study and Prayer Group. I'm so excited to be going to Israel, and uh, it's just amazing Um there was a question, I, I didn't see who asked it, but they're asking, will I be going to Judea? <laughs> well, it all depends if I get there before or after Netanyahu annexes it, uh, we'll just have to see. Um, but that's what we have going on, and I just want to let you know that this ministry is growing at the rate that it's growing because you people support it because you people pray for it, because you people donate financially, because you people buy the gospel tracts. Um, and, and without those things, we, 
we couldn't be doing what we're doing now. And God works through the ministration of his people. And and people come into my life and they give things and they're faithful with that. And then it's my responsibility to take what they give and be faithful with that and give it right back out and to keep that chain going exactly how the Lord would want to have it done. So um, thanks to you guys, the and and I guess I'm going to call it a program, but and it's something if you recall, if you've been listening to this program for a while, you know that we offer gospel tracks to people who cannot afford them. And we also started giving out free King James Bibles to people who cannot afford them. And many of you have donated specifically for that program. And right now in my studio, I have boxes and box, I have cases and cases and cases of King James Bibles that starting tomorrow are going to go out in the mail to people who cannot afford them. And we, the Now the End Begins family, are going to send these people free King James Bibles and free gospel tracts to people who can't afford them. And it's because, it's because that we're all doing this together as a family. And I just want to say thank you to everybody. Keep praying, keep giving, keep being a part, keep sharing the links to our website with people and the articles that we talk about. Um, it is absolutely having a major, major impact. And God is using it and God is blessing it. And like I said, we are now very global with over 2 million people attached to this network. And uh, God is preparing to send me to Israel in just a couple of months. So um, I am beyond excited and I'm so glad that we are all doing this together. And um, there's there's a, a lot of fruit attached to this ministry, and every single one of you that pray and give and share and do what the Lord puts on your heart to do, you all have a part in this ministry, and that's an amazing blessing. One more song, and we're going to get started tonight.
Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! Yevarechecha Adonai v'yishmerecha Ya'er Adonai pana v'lecha v'yichuneka Yisa Adonai pana v'lecha v'yasem lecha shalom The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Heavenly Father, we come before you one more time and we ask for your blessing on tonight's program, Lord. And as the hundreds of people pile into the chat room and people tuning in all over the world, uh, Lord, we just ask that you keep your sweet spirit here and let everything be done uh, decently and in order and that uh, your word would go forward in spirit and in truth, Father God. And we ask you to bless and work and move in a mighty way and open our eyes and our ears to what's coming in these end times, the end times that have already begun. And uh, we ask it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. For those of you who are new to the program and new to the chat room, we kindly ask that you, during the Bible teaching portion of the show, which is starting now, we just kindly ask that you keep the comments um, limited to what we're talking about during the Bible study. And uh, that way, when you guys ask questions that are related to what I'm talking about, I'll be able to see them in the chat room and I'll be able to um, efficiently and, and quickly answer any questions that you might have. So please, um, when the Bible study starts, which is starting right now, we ask that you keep the comments in the chat room limited to what we're talking about with the Bible study. So, tonight's topic, TJ in particular last week asked for this topic, uh, Antichrist, the four beasts, Nebuchadnezzar, and the coming ten nation confederacy from the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. Let's start in Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13 in your King James Bibles. And we're going to read verses 1 and 2 from Revelation chapter 13. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard... And his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth was as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. That's Revelation 13 verses 1 and 2 in your King James Bibles. Now, you will hear me mention the expression King James Bible dozens of times during this program. And there's a reason why I do that. And there's a reason why we stand on the authority of the King James Bible. The verses that I just read to you, especially Revelation 13, verse 1. And in Revelation 13, verse 1, it says, John is talking, and he says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rising up out of the sea. That's what the King James Bible says that John said. But when you go to the, the NIV and look at Revelation 13.1, you see something very, very different. You see the dragon stood on the shore of the sea. And if 
Jeanette could post Revelation 13, 1 in both the NIV and the King James, that would be great. But in Revelation 13, verse 1 in the NIV Bible, it says the dragon stood on the shore of the sea. But that is not what the King James Bible says in Revelation 13, verse 1. It says, and I stood upon the sand of the sea. You know what the NIV Bible does? The NIV Bible turns the Apostle John into the dragon, which is Satan. And this is why we don't use other Bibles besides the King James Bible, because these type of mistakes repeat themselves constantly. Why would you want to have a Bible that makes the Apostle John into the devil? But that's exactly what the NIV Bible does. And there's so, I mean, I don't want to go into it right now, but we could do, and maybe we will do a whole program on how the other Bibles massively distort what's going on in the King James Bible. So the King James Bible is the only Bible we use. It's our sole source of authority. Without that King James Bible, uh, now, TJ says, is that a mistake or is it intentional? Well, that's a great question. You know how I think. I think it's intentional. Um, but anyway, I don't want to get into a whole big discussion about the King James Bible, but it's just pertinent that here we are in Revelation 13, verse 1, and the NIV butchers it so very badly and turns the Apostle John into Satan. And so... If you have an NIV Bible, throw it into the garbage. And if you can't afford to buy a new one, send me an email at info at nowtheendbegins.com. And we're going to send you a brand new King James Bible to replace that non-Bible called the NIV. Uh, But let's get going with tonight's program. So Revelation 13 verses 1 and 2. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon, that's that's Satan, gave him his power and his seat and his great authority. Now, This beast that comes up out of the Mediterranean Ocean is not the same as the beast that we see in Revelation chapter 12. That's Satan himself. This beast that comes up out of the ocean in Revelation 13, this is Antichrist. That's who's coming up out of the ocean. And he is powered by Satan, but he's not Satan himself. Now, Revelation 13 will go on to say that the Antichrist is a man. His number is 666. And we also know that the Bible says that the Antichrist is the son of perdition. Now, if you know your Bible, then you know who the Antichrist is going to be, because the King James Bible already tells you who the Antichrist is going to be. There's only two people in the entire Bible that are called the son of perdition. That's Judas Iscariot and Antichrist. And when we study our Bible, we find out that Judas Iscariot and Antichrist are one in the same person. So I just put a link into the chat room. Read that when you have time. It's an article called The Real Reason Why the Devil Judas Went Out and Hung Himself on a Tree After Betraying Jesus. You know what Jesus says about Judas in John chapter 6, verses 70 and 71? Jesus answered them, Have I not chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him. So, there's only two people in the entire Bible 
that are called the son of perdition. Judas the betrayer, Jesus calls Judas a thief, a liar, and a murderer. That's exactly the qualities of Satan. The Bible says, Ye are of your father the devil, and his lusts you shall do. He was a murderer from the beginning. And very interestingly, those are the same qualities and attributes that Jesus applies to Judas. And I put a second link into the chat room. Does the King James Bible reveal the identity of the coming end times Antichrist? Spoiler alert, it absolutely does. And the Antichrist is Judas, the son of perdition. Now, Jade has a question. It's a good question. I get this question a lot. Why did Judas hang himself? He hung himself because the Bible says that Jesus was going to be crucified on a tree. Now, we know it was a Roman cross, but in six different places in your King James Bible, uh, we read verses that Jesus was hung on a tree. And we know from the Old Testament um, that talks about the 30 pieces of silver that uh, Jesus was betrayed for, and and we read that over and over and over um, about the betrayal that was to come. So Judas hung himself on a tree, and he used the money of betrayal to purchase it as a way to mock Jesus Christ, who would be crucified when the sun came up the next morning. Um, Clay says Satan killed him. That's right. Satan did kill him because uh, he had finished the job that Satan entered in to him to do. And when that job was done, Satan no longer had need for him. And Judas willingly hung himself. Uh, you remember the story of the maniac of Gadara. And Jesus cast the legion of demons out, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the legion of devils out of the maniac um, of Gadara. And what did those legion of devils do? They immediately asked Jesus if he could cast them into a herd of swine. And the second they entered into those pigs, the devils, those demons, ran those pigs into the ocean and drowned him. Drown them. Um, and that's exactly what we see with Judas. Uh, he hung himself because that's exactly where following the devil will lead you. It leads you to a bad, bad place. The Bible says that worldly sorrow leads to death, but godly sorrow leads to repentance. Uh, Peter and Judas both betrayed Jesus Christ. But Judas was filled with the devil, and he hung himself. Peter was filled with the Holy Ghost eventually, and he repented, and Jesus restored him. So, getting back to Revelation uh, 13, verse 1 and 2, we see that there's this beast that comes up out of the sea, out of the Mediterranean Sea. So when, all right, so the first point that we're going to talk about tonight is people say, why does the Antichrist, why do people think that the Antichrist comes from either the Middle East or from Europe? Because of Revelation 13, verse 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea. That is the Mediterranean Sea where John would have been. And many, many times in the Bible, we see the Mediterranean Ocean or sea being referred to. And here it is being referred to in Revelation 13, verse 1. So the, this beast comes up out of the sea and John says that it has seven heads and ten horns and upon his horns ten crowns and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Now, John sees a beast. Now, follow this now. John sees a... Now, Roxanne has a question. She is asking, does the, does the sea in Revelation 13.1 represent Gentile nations? No. 
the sea in Revelation 13, verse 1, represents an actual body of water on the earth. It is not, um, and let me see if I can find the verse in Revelation 12 quickly. Um, where is it that says that, I'm pretty sure it's it, it's in 12, where it says that the dragon comes up out of the water. Um, that is a reference to nations. But here in Revelation 13, verse 1, in Revelation 13, verse 1, the sea that John is talking about is the Mediterranean Sea or ocean. So, Antichrist, anti, um, Estevic says, why the Mediterranean Sea? This was a vision. Absolutely, it was a vision, but you have to realize, Estevic, that John is being given a vision in heaven about things that are happening on earth. All right, I'll say that again. John is in heaven and he's being given a vision of things that are happening on earth. No, he's not in Patmos. He's not in Patmos at all. Uh, that's where he was banished. But turn to Revelation chapter 4. Turn to Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. And after this I looked, and behold, a door was open in heaven, and the first voice I heard, uh, which I heard, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. So John is taken from the island of Patmos, and he is transported to heaven. And when he is in heaven, he is now seeing things that are taking place upon the earth. Turn to John chapter, um, Gospel of John chapter 21. John chapter 21, and I want to show you in the Gospels, that Jesus promised John that he would see these things. Turn to John chapter 21. This is really, really cool. Turn to John chapter 21, and we're going to start reading um, in verse 17, and we're going to go all the way down to 25. John 21, we're going to start in 17, and we're going to go all the way down to 25. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, feed my sheep. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, Thou girded thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, Peter, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This he spake, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, Peter, follow me. Then Peter turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following, that's John, which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter, seeing him, John, saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? Jesus saith unto him, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Then went this saying abroad among the brethren that that disciple should not die, yet Jesus said not unto him he shall not die, but if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? This is the disciple, John, which testifieth of these things and wrote these things, and we know that this his testimony is true. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which 
if it should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not the could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. So, why are we reading John chapter 21? Because Jesus said about John that John would live long enough to see the second coming. And John did live long enough to see the second coming because we read in Revelation which is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Turn to Revelation chapter 1. Turn to Revelation chapter 1. And let's look at this verse. Let's look at this verse. Revelation chapter 1, verse 9 and 10. Revelation chapter 1, verse 9 and 10. And Ella, I see your question on the seven-headed beast, and we're going to answer your question tonight. Um, Revelation 1, verses 9 and 10. I, John, from the Gospel of John, the same John that Jesus said would live long enough to see the second coming. I, John, verse 9, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that was called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Now, the Apostle John is the disciple that Jesus loved from John 21. Jesus told Peter in John 21 that Peter was going to be crucified upside down and he was going to be gird and bounded Um, when he got older, and he would be taken to a place where he didn't want to go. So that was the prophecy that Jesus gave to Peter in John 21. And Jesus prophesies about John, and he says that John will not die until John sees the return of Jesus Christ at the second coming. Now, John was banished to the island of Patmos, and they tried, the secular record says they tried to boil John in oil, and it had no effect on him. I don't know if that's true. It certainly could be. It sounds true, but that's the secular record. But we know for a fact that John was banished after that. Whatever happened, he was banished to the island of Patmos, And while he was banished there, Jesus called him up to heaven in a type of the rapture that we see in Revelation 4, verses 1 and 2. And John was taken up into heaven, and what was he shown? He was shown some things in heaven, absolutely, but he was also shown things in heaven that happen on the earth. So when John is up in heaven and he's looking down, he is looking at the entire time of Jacob's trouble and the great tribulation. He is seeing it all. And that's what John sees when he is in heaven. Um, he is seeing the earth and God is showing John From heaven, in a vision, he's showing him every single event that's going to happen in the time of Jacob's trouble. Now, David makes a comment about things that um, uh, he was not able to to, uh, utter. That's actually the Apostle Paul. And let's turn um, in our Bibles to where Paul talks about things that were not lawful for him to utter in 2 Corinthians 12. Let's read 2 Corinthians 12, verses 1 through 4. 2 Corinthians 12, verses 1 through 4. 
Amen, and we are back for hour two of the Sunday Night Radio Bible Study. Tonight's topic, if you're just tuning in, we're looking at the Ten Nation Confederacy and the Four Beasts from Revelation chapter 13 and Daniel chapter 7. So, right before the break, we were talking about 2 Corinthians 12, verses 1 through 4. And Paul says, um, we'll look at verses 3 and 4 again. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell God knoweth, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. So, um, the Apostle Paul was taken up to the third heaven exactly like the Apostle John was taken up into the third heaven, and they were shown, I, I'm assuming that Paul was shown something very similar to what the Apostle John was shown, but Paul was told not to talk about it, and John was told to write it in a book. And that's exactly what John did. He wrote it in a book, and that's where we get the book of Revelation from. So, Back to the four beasts from Revelation 13, verses 1 and 2. This beast, John tells us in Revelation 13, And the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power. So, we read Revelation 13, verses 1 and 2, and what do we do with it? We don't even know what to do with that unless... We go to Daniel chapter 7, verses 1 through 7. Daniel chapter 7, verses 1 through 7. And when we read that, we begin to realize that what John was shown is exactly the same thing that Daniel was shown many, many, many years earlier. Daniel 7, verses 1 through 7 says this. Daniel 7, verses 1 through 7. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven strove upon the great sea. That's the Mediterranean Sea. And four beasts came up, from the sea, diverse from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings, and I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked and was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second, like a bear, like to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side and had three ribs in, it, in the mouth of it between the teeth of it, and they said thus to it, Arise and devour much flesh. After this I beheld, and lo, another, like a leopard, which had on the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. And after this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly. And it had great iron teeth that devour and break in pieces and stamp the, the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Now, do you see how similar Daniel 7, 1 through 7 is to Revelation 13, verses 1 and 2? Do you see how similar Daniel 7, 1 through 7 is to Revelation 13, verses 1 and 2? Well, it is similar because they're describing exactly the same thing. So what Daniel is given in a vision for the far-flung future, John, when he's taken up into the third heaven, he John gets to see Daniel's vision actually fulfilled down on the earth. So, Daniel 7, 1 through 7, Daniel had no idea what he was looking at. But John, when he saw the same thing in Revelation 13, John knew exactly what he was looking at. Now, let's take a look at this beast 
that we see in Revelation 13, the same beast that we see in Daniel 7, 1 through 7. So the first thing that we understand about this beast, it has a mouth like a lion. Now, one thing you have to remember, we what you have to remember about the beasts in Daniel and in Revelation, they're the same ones. The beasts are kings and kingdoms. They are primarily talking about a king, but they are talking about a king in connection to a kingdom. So, Revelation 13, verse 1, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having um, seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns. Okay? Now, John notices that this beast has a mouth like a lion. If you had a guess, what nation is represented by a lion? Can anyone in the chat room take a whack at that? John says that this beast has a mouth like a lion. Megan has it right. Great Britain, England is the lion. The mouth like a lion represents England. Now, why England? Well, England is where the world language uh, language of English comes from. The entire world language in the year 2020 is English. It comes from England or Great Britain. And so, all the world right now has one language that is considered the global language, and that is English. Mouth like a lion. And did you also know that England, not only did they give us the last world language, they also give us absolute time. Absolute time is something called GMT, Greenwich Mean Time. They also give us absolute temperature. If you go to buy an air conditioner, the salesman might say to you, Hey, Mr. Smith, how many BTUs would you like your air conditioner to be? Do you know what BTU stands for? BTU stands for British Thermal Unit. So, England gives us the world language. England gives us absolute time, which is Greenwich Mean Time. England gives us absolute temperature, which is BTUs or British thermal units. And you're going to love this one. England gave us absolute truth with the King James Holy Bible. So when John says that this beast had a mouth like a lion, we are looking at the kingdom of the nation of England. So if you're taking notes, you might want to write that down. Uh, The mouth like a lion represents England or Great Britain. And all those things that I just mentioned to you comes from those things. Um, John noticed that the beast had feet like a bear. Bear represents Russia. Russia is called the Russian bear. And uh, Russia... Absolutely, in the early part of the 20th century, sprung up into world prominence, so much so that by the 1960s, the United States and Russia were on the verge of nuclear war. Russia went from a nothing, dirt poor country to a world superpower in 60 years in the first part of the 20th century. And that's, I mean, history records that to be true. So when John sees that this beast has a feet like a bear, he is talking about Russia. Now, those of you who like to study Bible prophecy, we know that Magog, which features prominently in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, uh, Magog is Russia. And um, they are going to come into huge prominence in the near future, in the days after the rapture. 
Now, I've written an article. I don't have time to go into Gog and Magog and all those things, but suffice to say that Ezekiel chapter 39 is the Battle of Armageddon, and Ezekiel chapter 38 is the Battle of Gog and Magog. They are two separate battles. They are fought 1,000 years apart, and Russia is Magog in both those situations. And I'm just going to put a link into the chat room that you can read that when you have time. If you're not in the chat room, you can go to nowtheendbegins.com and you can do a search and you can find the all the articles that we are talking about. So when John says he saw a beast with a mouth like a lion, he was talking about the kingdom of England and... We mentioned all those things that that God used England for. Then the beast had feet as a bear. And we see Russia. The entire 20th century was, people say it was the American century because America discovered so many things and invented so many things and was involved in so many things. And that is true. The 20th century absolutely belongs to America But let me tell you, right in second place is Russia because they came up from nothing. And then by the time that I was a very small child, I was only two years old or one years old. um, We had the Bay of Pigs and President Kennedy was on the verge of declaring war with Russia, who was pointing nuclear weapons at America in the early 1960s. So the 20th century saw the rise of the Russian bear. It also saw the decline of the nation of England. Now, the third part of this beast that John sees in Revelation 13, this is a really interesting one. He sees that the beast is like a leopard. Now, what do you think that if if the lion represents England and the bear represents Russia, what nation would the leopard represent? What nation would the leopard represent? represent. I'll give you a second to think about that. What nation would the leopard represent? It represents the United States of America. And so for all of you people, all of you people that are always asking, where is America in Bible prophecy? Um, America is the leopard. Now think about what a leopard is. A leopard is a multi-integrated animal. The top of a leopard is yellow-brown. The bottom of a leopard is white. And it's covered with spots. All right, I'll say that again. When you look at what a leopard looks like, if you look at a lion, if you look at a lion, it's almost one solid color. If you look at a panther, it's one solid color. But if you look at a leopard, it's brown, it's yellow, it's orange, and its entire belly is white, and it's covered with spots all over the place. All right? Now, there was a poem called The New Colossus, and I want to read a piece of this poem to you. The New Colossus, it was written in 1883 on November 2nd by Emma Lazarus, and this poem is engraved at the bottom of the Statue of Liberty. Listen to this poem. It's called The New Colossus, and it is the poem on the Statue of Liberty. Not like the brazen giant of Greek fame with conquering limbs astride from land to land, here at our sea-washed sunset gate shall stand a mighty woman with a torch 
whose flame is the imprisoned lightning, and her name, Mother of Exiles. From her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome, her mild eyes command, the air-bridged harbor that Twin Cities frame. Keep, ancient lands, your storied pomp, cries she with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. The wretched refuse of your teeming shore, send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I will lift my lamp beside the golden door. America is a land that is made up of immigrants from every single country on the face of the earth. My grandfather came here as an immigrant in 1922. I am the grandson of an immigrant. On my dad's side, our family came here in 1732. The point being, everybody who comes here Everybody who comes here to America comes here from some place else. So when we say that we're American, okay, we're born here, but my nationality, I'm Pennsylvania Dutch, I'm German, I'm Irish, and I'm Scottish, okay? America is the melting pot. And that's in the early 20th century, the late 19th century, immigrants began to flood to America from every country on the face of the earth, just like a leopard. A leopard is brown, it's yellow, it's orange, it's white, and it has spots. And that's an excellent representation of what America, the melting pot, is. Now... Here is another thing connected to the leopard. And and now we're going to really get to something here now. The leopard is covered with spots. And when you look at what spots represent in the Bible, Ephesians 5 verse 27, Ephesians 5 verse 27 that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. That's Ephesians 5.27. Jude chapter 1 verse 12. These are spots in your feast of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds and trees, whose fruit withereth, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. That's Jude one twelve. And others, save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment that is spotted by the flesh. Now, do you see why that there is a beast that is a leopard that is covered with spots? And those three verses that I just gave you, the Bible is very careful to point out is that spots are a bad thing. Spots are a very bad thing. And spots are connected with the mark of the beast. Now, if you've been following the news on Now the End Begins, let's take a look at the story that we published immediately before showtime tonight. And I want to just read this headline to you. And it is quite possible that the Mark of the Beast system is being created right now. And it's being created in America. If you've been following any of the stories that we've been writing for the past month, you know that we are living in unbelievable, unprecedented, unbelievable times right now. So unbelievable, I had to say it twice. But the story that we published right before going on the air tonight, here's the headline. Shock, as it's revealed an enzyme called luciferase, is what makes Bill Gates' implantable quantum dot microneedle vaccination delivery system work. And uh, for those of you who were with us on Wednesday night, I published this picture 
I published this picture and I want you to take a look. We had NTEB reader Matt and he took the words that we use, human implantable quantum dot microneedle vaccination delivery system. And he added up all the letters and assigned them numeric value from the alphabet. And it didn't add up to much of anything interesting until he removed the word human and then it added up to 666. Those glowing pictures that you see in the chat room, those glowing purple X's, you're looking at the forerunner for the Mark of the Beast and it was invented here in America. The Leopard Country. Revelation 13 is the Mark of the Beast passage. Now do you see why God uses a leopard to represent America? We are a melting pot. We are a nation of immigrants. We have black people, Asian people, white people, people of, from, from, from all races and ethnicities. And then we have the animal covered with spots. And that's exactly what we're seeing happening in America right now. Now, and uh, we have talked for many, many weeks now about what Bill Gates is doing and about the mark of the beast and what Emmanuel Macron is doing. And and could it be possible that he's uh, the Antichrist? I don't know, but he's sure starting to look like one. Why did Microsoft patent a device that goes inside the human body? and helps you to buy and sell cryptocurrency. Why would Microsoft do that? The Mark of the Beast is a device that is attached to your body that allows you to conduct buying and selling. Microsoft patented a device for selling cryptocurrency, and the patent number that they were assigned was 666. 060606. Now, you can't make. And these things we have been reporting faithfully for the last six or seven weeks now that we're seeing an explosion of end times information. And it's happening in front of us. Um, is it possible that the Antichrist is walking around right now? Uh, absolutely it is. And in fact, um, he absolutely is. And, uh, that's how close to the end of everything that we are right now, that we are actually watching the establishment of, and let's call it the forerunner to the Mark of the Beast system. And that's what is happening right now. And that's why you see John sees that this beast is like a leopard. And because he's seeing a great, great and mighty nation made up of people from all different walks of life, all different ethnicities and races. And he sees that this animal is covered with spots. Now, we're going to take a quick break. But when we come back, we have a solid half hour to go, and we're going to cover all your questions. We're going to talk about the mark of the beast. We're going to talk about Daniel's image, and we're going to talk about the covenant that the Jewish people are going to make with death and hell. And uh, when we come back, that's what we're going to talk about. So don't go away. We'll be right back in three minutes. Don't go anywhere. The Bible says my king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I wonder do you know him. My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially. 
utterly merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he beautifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's the key to knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the doorway of deliverance. He's the pathway of peace. He's the roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. I wish I could describe him to you. He's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. Well, you can't get him out of your mind. You can't, you can't get him off of your head. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Terror couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him, and the grave couldn't hold him. Yeah. back. And I just want to take a quick moment to pray for somebody in the chat room. Um, their screen name is looking up and they're having some problems with a family member during this broadcast. And I just like us to pray as a, as a church family, um, for that situation there. Heavenly father, we just pray. We don't, I don't know what the need is in that house, Lord, with that family, but you do. So we pray, Lord, for looking up, and we pray that uh, the spirit of peace would um, would uh, would be sent to that house, and and that whatever problem that they're having with a child or a relative, I'm not quite sure. I just it's a family member, Lord, and we just pray that you would give the spirit of peace to looking up and um, uh, his um, his family. And uh, we ask you, Lord, to protect there and to work and to move. And if there's people there that needs uh, to be saved, we ask that you save them, Lord. We ask you to keep everybody safe. And uh, Father God, we just, as a church family, we pray for looking up and um, that salvation might truly come to that house. And uh, we just thank you and praise you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. If you are new to this program, we invite you to join our free subscription list. And uh, we have almost 15,000 people who receive our email updates and our prophecy news um, every single day, multiple times per day. And um, this is a free service, and we invite you to take advantage of it. And um, we will send you the updates and you'll be the first to have them. It, it will be sent to your email box the second that we publish an article. I just put a link into the chat room. But if you haven't subscribed, it's a free subscription. If you haven't subscribed to Now the End Begins, we ask that you take a moment and click on that link and just put your email address in. We don't ever sell it to anybody. We don't ever give your information away. Uh, we respect and value your, prov your privacy. We don't sell your data. 
Nevada. And uh, we don't do anything with your email address except we send you emails. And it's a really good system, and you will be notified every time we have a podcast or a Bible study, every time we have a new article and Bible teaching, it will be sent to your email box first. So we invite you to sign up for this free service. All right, we have a half hour, and let's see how much that we can cover. So this beast that John saw in Revelation 13, verse 1 and 2, is the same beast that Daniel saw in Daniel 7, verses 1 through 7. And we told you that the lion represents England, the bear, communist Russia, and the leopard represents the United States of America and We talked about the spots in connection with the mark of the beast. And then we showed you that in America right now, surrounding all this COVID-19 crisis and hysteria and whatever you want to call it, it's a real virus. People are really dying, but they have hijacked it to bring in the new world order. And we have shown you in countless articles that the mark of the beast system or at the very least, its forerunner is being developed in America right now, and spots are connected with the mark of the beast, and they're a bad thing. So, let's move on. Let's talk about the the statue that Daniel saw. Turn to Daniel chapter 2, and we're going to read verses 31 through 35. Daniel chapter 2, 31 through 35. Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest, till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them, and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain, and filled the whole earth." That is Daniel chapter 2, verses 31 through 35. Now, this image is divided into five sections. Head of gold, silver breast and arms, a brass belly and thighs, um, iron legs, and iron and clay feet and toes. Starting at the very top, the head of gold is Babylon. This would be around 606 BC. So the head of gold is the kingdom of King Nebuchadnezzar. And he is a king that rules with impunity. He is a complete and total dictator. And Nebuchadnezzar is a type of antichrist. Uh, You recall that in the book of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar takes credit for what God did just like Lucifer in Isaiah 14 wants what God has. And God made uh, Nebuchadnezzar walk around on his hands and feet and grow his hair down to his waist and his nails became claws and he ate grass like an ox for seven years. Nebuchadnezzar is a type of antichrist in the seven-year time of Jacob's trouble. So the head of gold in Daniel's statue is Babylon. Silver breast and arms is the kingdom of the Media Persian Empire, which came in right after Babylon was taken down. Now, why does it go from gold to silver? Why does it go from gold to silver? Because the silver is less valuable than gold. Nebuchadnezzar rules with complete authority, 
But the kingdom that comes after Babylon, Media Persia, does not have that type of authority. But the kingdom that comes after Babylon, Media Persia, is a less powerful kingdom. And then, of course, the brass, the, uh, uh, the belly and thighs of brass, that is the kingdom of Greece. That is the kingdom of Greece. And they, um, they are less powerful than the Media Persian Empire. So as this statue begins to go down towards the feet, the kingdoms get less and less powerful. Babylon, Media Persia, Greece... And then the iron legs represents Rome, which ruled from approximately 100 BC to about 440 AD. So Rome is the iron legs, and they ruled from 100 BC to about 440, 430 AD. And they are the iron legs, and Rome had nowhere near the power of Babylon or Persia, and they barely had the power that Greece had. And then, of course, the toes and the feet, it is iron mixed with clay, which is a worthless material. So by the time you get down to the feet, where the toes are, and the iron is mixed with the clay, now you've gotten to the revived Roman Empire, You get down to the revived Roman Empire with the feet and the toes of iron mixed with clay. And that's exactly what we are waiting to see in our day today is the revived Roman Empire, which, and we talk about Macron, it is quite possible that we could be seeing the ruler rising up from Europe. Now, somebody asked, Somebody asked about Macron, and they asked if he had Assyrian blood. I have something very exciting to report to you. We have been working on something behind the scenes for about a week now. I have an excellent contact. Her name is Lori, and and uh, she has been doing some fact-finding that is just... She has been researching the genealogy of Emmanuel Macron at a very, very high level. And she has come up with proof that Emmanuel Macron, in his direct lineage, has Jewish blood and he also has Assyrian blood. So I am excited to tell you that we have found proof that connects Emmanuel Macron with Jewish ancestry and Assyrian ancestry. Now, I'm not saying that Macron is the Antichrist. I am not saying that. But I am saying it's quite a possibility, and we're going to keep looking at Emmanuel Macron, the the a man who said that he wants to rule Europe like the Roman god Jupiter. And he said that eight weeks after being elected as president of the nation of France, he said that he wanted to rule France and he wanted to rule um, uh, uh, Europe as the Roman god Jupiter. And uh, he is a man that absolutely could be connected to Antichrist. Uh, We're not saying for sure, but we're going to keep a very, very close eye. Now, Carl has a question. Uh, Is Babylon, when the Bible talks about mystery Babylon in Revelation chapter 17, is it talking about the uh, nation of Babylon, which is in modern day Iraq? Or is it talking about the United States? Neither. Mystery Babylon is the revived Roman Empire in the form of a mystery religion that we call the Catholic Church, which was created 
by the nation, by the kingdom of Rome. If you call yourself a Roman Catholic, as I did for 29 years, you are acknowledging that your religion was created by the pagan kingdom of Rome. That's where the Roman Catholic Church comes from. That's where their lineage goes back to. So the legs in Daniel's statue, the iron legs, is the nation of, uh, it is the kingdom of Rome. But the iron mixed with the miry clay in the feet and the toes, that is the revived Roman Empire that is a, it's in mystery form and we call it the Vatican and the Roman Catholic Church. So when the, when the book of Revelation talks about mystery Babylon, it is not talking about uh, the kingdom of Babylon and it is not talking about America. America is the leopard, but Babylon is the Roman Catholic Church. And I was a Roman Catholic for 29 years before I got saved. And I can verify to you that everything that Revelation 17 and 18 says about the Roman Catholic Church and the Vatican, it is 100% true. That's what I was um, taught in all those years in Catholic school. I was trained by Franciscans. I was trained by Jesuits. I was an altar boy for three years. Many of you have that same testimony. Um, but suffice to say, when I got saved and I began to read the passages about Mystery Babylon as a Catholic, I knew exactly who John was talking about. You didn't have to sell me for a second that the Vatican and the Roman Catholic Church is Mystery Babylon because I lived that life for 29 years and I recognized her the second that I saw her. Um, so the United States is the leopard, uh, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, but Babylon is going to reappear in mystery form and it's going to be the revived Roman Empire under Antichrist. So, that's Daniel's statue. Now, the Bible talks about the seven heads of the dragon with ten crowns. The seven heads of the dragon with ten crowns. And here are those seven heads. Nimrod, king of Babel. Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Sennacherib, king of Assyria. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Cyrus, king of Persia, Alexander, king of Greece, and Caesar, king of Rome. So when Revelation 13 talks about the dragon with the seven heads, those are the seven heads of the dragon. And the Antichrist in the revived Roman Empire that Daniel saw with the miry clay mixed with the iron that's the eighth one that's going to come. Now, when it talks about the Ten Nation Confederacy, the Ten Nation Confederacy, that is the seven heads of the dragon plus England, Russia, and the United States. Now, Shea Caster has a question. Is the regular Catholic Church the same as the Roman Catholic Church? Absolutely. Uh, there is only one Catholic Church. The word Catholic does not mean universal. That is That was taken from a, 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 a Plato wrote about that word Catholic. Uh, meaning universal, but Plato was wrong when he used that uh, application. And the word, now look, use your brains, use your brain. If you're an alcoholic, okay, when I got saved, I was an alcoholic because I have spent my whole life struggling with alcohol. Uh, God has given me the victory, but it is a day-by-day -day battle. And for those of you who are, have struggled with alcohol, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So, look at the word alcoholic. 
Okay, it's made up of two words, alco and holic. All right, I'm going to break that down for you. An alcoholic means somebody who is wholly given to alcohol. So that word holic means holy. Not holy as in God is holy, but W-H-O-L-L-Y. Holic means holy, something that you were completely given over to. Now, if you are a chocoholic, that means you are wholly given to the love of chocolate. If you are a chocoholic, you are... Um, no, uh, Jade is wondering, did I ban her? No, but there was a conversation going on that was getting out of control and I momentarily kicked you out because it was going in a very, from what I could see, whatever that conversation was, it was going in a very bad direction. So hopefully whatever that problem was, you guys have resolved it. But um, I did not ban, I just temporarily kicked uh, you guys got to be on your best behavior. I can't lose control of the chat room. So if I see something that looks like it's going to be a problem, I'm going to temporarily kick whatever I th see as the problem. So please, um, let's everybody be on their best behavior, but no, Jade, you are not banned. Uh, I would not ban you. Um, so if you are a chocoholic, if you are a chocoholic, you are somebody who is wholly given to the love of chocolate. If you are a alcoholic, you are somebody who is wholly given to the love of alcohol. If you are a workaholic, if you are a workaholic, you are somebody that is wholly given to the love of your job. Okay? An alcoholic loves alcohol. A chocolateholic loves chocolate. A workaholic loves work. So now let me ask you a question. What does a cathaholic love? What does a cathaholic love? If an alcohol, if an alcoholic loves alcohol and a workaholic loves work and a chocoholic loves chocolate, what does a cathaholic love? What does a cat holic love? Lorianne said it. They love cats. Now, that sounds like a funny thing until you realize that Egypt, which is where Babylon comes from, Egypt worshipped cats. In Egypt, cats were considered deity. So, why would the Roman Catholic Church, why would they be associated with cats? Because they are associated with Egypt, because they are associated with paganism, and when you look back in Egypt, I just put a picture in the chat room Look at that picture and tell me what you see. I just put a picture into the chat room. What do you see in that picture? Take a good, long, hard look at that photo and tell me what you see. You see the Egyptian Sphinx. And what is the Sphinx? It is a cat man. And it's giant. And it's enormous. And it's a hybrid between a human and a cat. And that is why the Roman Catholic Church is called the Catholic Church. Because they love and they worship cats. They are a pagan religion. And their roots go back to Babylon and Egypt. So... That word Catholic does not mean universal. It means someone who is given to the love of cats. And of course, it is not house cats. 
but uh, it is the the uh, the pagan nation of Egypt and the pagan nation of Babylon. Now, we're almost out of time, but I want to look at a couple of more verses, and I'm just going to quickly put these verses into the chat room, and I want to show you the covenant that the Jewish people make with Antichrist, okay? I want to show you the covenant that the Jewish people make with Antichrist. Everybody has read this verse from Daniel 9.27, Daniel 9.27, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Now, that is the covenant that the Jewish people make with Antichrist in Daniel 9.27. And a lot of people speculate what that covenant is. And I want to show you what that covenant is. In Isaiah chapter 28, in Isaiah chapter 28, verses 15 and 16, we read this. It is Isaiah talking to the Jewish people about the time of Jacob's trouble. Because ye have said, we have made a covenant with death and with hell are we at agreement. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us. For we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood have we hid ourselves. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion. For a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. So the Jewish people make a covenant with death and with hell. Now, have you ever seen in the book of Revelation when Jesus in Revelation chapter 6 begins to open up the seals? What is the very last seal? The four, Well, it's not the last seal. The fourth seal from the book of Revelation. Take a look at that. The first seal of the book of Revelation chapter 6 is Antichrist. The fourth seal, And I looked and behold a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and hell followed him, and power was given the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword and with hunger and with death the beasts of the earth. All right, so look. Isaiah says that the Jewish people make a covenant with death and hell. Jesus says that death and hell are one of the seals that are released in Revelation chapter 6 at the start of the time of Jacob's trouble. So we know for a fact right now that the covenant that the Antichrist shall from, remember, Antichrist is the first seal. Death and hell are the fourth seal. So the Jews are going to make a covenant with death and with hell, and that is what is going to eventually drive them to hide in Selah And then, of course, Isaiah goes on to say that God himself will come back at the second coming and will break that covenant with death And we read about that in Isaiah chapter 28, verses 18 and 19. And your covenant with death shall be disannulled, and your agreement with hell shall not stand. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, then ye shall be trodden down by it. From the time that it goeth forth, it shall take you. For morning by morning shall it pass over, by day and by night, and it shall be a vexation only to understand the report. Now, Dominga has a question. Does the rapture come before the first seal? It absolutely does. The rapture is the very first event that takes place. So, when we see Bill Gates with this Mark of the Beast system that he's creating, we know that by the time, if that is the Mark of the Beast, we know that by the time it's finished, we're not going to be here. 
Because the first thing that happens before the mark of the beast is released, before Antichrist, before the covenant with death and hell, what is the very first main event that is going to take place? It is going to be the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. That is a fact. That is a guarantee. Read that article I just put into the chat room called The Pre-Tribulation Rapture of the Church, an Essential Doctrine of the Christian Faith. The Pre-Tribulation Rapture is going to come first. So when you see Emmanuel Macron and Bill Gates doing all their nonsense, you know that that's, if we're that close to the mark of the beast, we are going to be even closer to the pre-tribulation rapture. Now, TJ uh, suggested that it might be a good idea to do a program on preparing to leave family and friends who are going to be left behind. And I think that is a fantastic idea. So this Wednesday night, Lord willing, we're going to do that program on our Wednesday night two-hour Bible study. So please join us we are this the entire program is going to be devoted to friends and loved ones that will be left behind when we leave in the rapture uh sure foundation says if the vaccination is taken before the rapture it can't be the mark of the beast that's right but that doesn't mean that the vaccination system that Bill Gates is creating is not going to become the mark of the beast after we leave. So please, join us Wednesday night. We're going to do a program called Left Behind, and it's going to be geared towards the loved ones that aren't coming with us. Uh, so please, tune in Wednesday night for that program, but you don't have to wait till Wednesday. Tomorrow, right here, at 12 o'clock noon Eastern Standard Time, we're going to give you another episode of the NTEB Prophecy News Podcast. And we're going to do that right here tomorrow, Monday, Lord willing, at noon. So tune in tomorrow at noon for another episode of the NTEB Prophecy News Podcast. I thank you for tuning in tonight. I love that God has expanded our borders, that we have over 2 million people now connected to the Now the End Begins Global Network combined with the Bible study and prayer group. And we are so excited that God is using us in this way at this time and that you, the awesome NTEB family of believers and the NTEB readers and the people who pray and give and, and share our links, you make it possible. And God is working through all of us to get something done on these end times. And it's an amazing, amazing thing. What a day it's going to be when we hear those words come up hither. What a wonderful, glorious day it will be. I'm going to see you here tomorrow, 12 o'clock noon, Eastern Standard Time. Until then, good night, everybody.